This program is brought to you by Emory University. On January 31, 2014, the Center for Faculty Development and Excellence at Emory University, the Fox Center for Humanistic Inquiry, and the University Research Council hosted a discussion titled Grant Writing in the Humanities. The panelists offered practical advice for creating and submitting successful grant proposals to the National Endowment for the Humanities. The speakers were Yana Yanakakis, Associate Professor of History at Emory, Clifton Kreis, Professor of History at Emory, and Jason Rohde, Senior Program Officer in the Office of Digital Humanities at the National Endowment for the Humanities. I was lucky enough in 2011 to get an ACLS um, and an NEH summer stipend to work on my, um, my current book project. Um, I am in the history department. I, I focus on the history of Mexico um, and of Native people. And my book project uh, focuses on the role of translation and social networks in popular legal culture in uh, Mexico in the 19th and uh, 18th and 19th centuries. Um, so, you know, when I uh, started writing grants for this book project, um, I really didn't proceed from any formula. Um, I had just arrived at Emory in 2009, and my um, chair, well, he wasn't chair at the time, but my senior colleague, who's a nudge and is now our chair, came down and said to me, you know, um, they're accepting applications for the NEH summer stipend because it's an internal competition, and then um, the, uh, the Office of Grant Writing here sifts through them and forwards two applications from the college um, onto the NEH. And I said, sure, I'll give it a try. So, um, you know, I, I drafted a, um, I took a few passes at it and put together a, a three-page narrative, sent it off. I was selected, but then, you know, at the level of the NEH, I got turned down. Um, and I guess that's kind of the first, uh, the first thing I would have to say, which is that often successful grants aren't written the first time around, right? You have to sometimes try, try, and get, try, and try again um, if you don't succeed at first. So uh, my first go at it was not successful. The great thing about the NEH is that they do provide you with reader comments. Um, and those are incredibly helpful. And it can be a little bit scarring, to be honest. So after that first, that first go around, I had a, I had a relatively positive, um, there were two, two reviewers. and two reviews were sent to me. One of them uh, was actually quite harsh. One of them was quite positive. But that harsh um, commentary really kind of spurred me to uh, re reorient my project and to rethink it and to kind of patch up the holes and to um, kind of broaden the scope. And uh, I got back to writing the following year and you know, kind of determined to prove them wrong, that I could do it. And uh, I sent the application in again and, and was successful. Um, so, you know, it, it's, not, uh, it's not something that necessarily comes immediately, right? Sometimes this grant writing pro uh, process is, is a process of, of trial and error. Um, and it's wonderful to be able to get that kind of feedback um, from an institution, a granting agency, um, to rework, uh, rework your formula. Um, so I guess some of the, the things that I would say for the you know, first time grant writer um, is to start early, right? Uh, when I worked to retool my, my grant the second time around, I began on August 1st. You know, those first three weeks in August when there's not a whole lot going on in the university is a great time to just immerse yourself in the grant writing process. I find that total immersion actually was the way to go. Um, Honing a narrative, um, you know, they only give you about five pages for the ACLS, for example, um, is, is kind of a tough job, right? You're, you're putting a book into five pages, and five pages that you're hoping will grab the attention of um, a, a range of, of panelists, of, of reviewers. Um, so I think starting early and total immersion um, are, at least they were successful for me. I think they're, they're good tips. Um, I think that as, as you do that, it's really important to take a step back from your project. Uh, I think that so many of us, um, as we're developing new ideas for a project, are very immersed um, in the debates and conversations within our subdisciplines or our subfields. And uh, you can get kind of 
hermetically sealed in those debates. Um, and I, I think that's not helpful. I think you really do need to air it out, open the windows, and um, use language and use concepts and ideas that travel across boundaries, disciplinary boundaries, um, that uh, talk about um, contemporary relevance, for example, if you are a historian, um, and that uh, kind of make a case for the broader intellectual significance of your project. Um, that's you know, just incredibly important. I think you know, one thing you can do is imagine that you're explaining the project to a colleague in another department, um, or even you know, uh, to, I don't know, a librarian right at your public library. That is someone who is you know, generally well-educated but may not know the specifics of your discipline. Um, I think that that can be a little tricky in that one of the, the things that you have to do as you write a successful grant is to convince your audience of its scholarly merit, which does involve um, you know, some, some technical language, but also um, really convince, uh, convince the audience of its broader appeal um, to its relevance outside of your immediate discipline. So in this regard, um, what I found useful, and this is really kind of about my personal style, um, was to be you know, highly narrative in my, uh, my grant proposal. Um, I told a story, right? So I would say, don't be afraid to tell a story. Uh, I actually opened my ACLS application with um, a story about attending a baptism in a remote uh, native community in deep in the mountains of southern Mexico. Um, and I drew a straight line from that story to my historical project. And I had some colleagues, you know, take a look at it and ask for their feedback. And they said, that's the best part of, you know, of the, the proposal. I was a little unsure about it. I'm like, oh, does this seem, you know, too personal? Does it seem, I don't know, uh, too gimmicky? But um, it was something I, I kind of felt in my gut might work. And I, I do think it was a successful hook. Um, so, you know, I would... I have a feeling that perhaps what was appealing about, about that story was that, um, you know, it may have, uh, you know, I imagined panelists, you know, reading over, poring over lots of applications with dry academic prose, and I thought, well, you know, maybe this, this is a breath of fresh air. I'm also a storyteller by nature, and my discipline um, is very much invested in, in storytelling, so I just put that strength to work for me. Um, and you know that that could vary for any of you in, dif in different disciplines. Um, I think another thing to keep in mind is that one proposal does not fit all. So I was successful with the NEH and the ACLS. I also kind of used a version of that uh, five-page ACLS grant and expanded it um, to apply for an NSF, a National Science Foundation Law and Society grant, which tends to be oriented more towards social sciences. Um, I thought it was the best of my three grants, but you know, I, I was not successful. And uh, I learned the reason I was not successful is because the presentation of the grant um, was not scientific enough. So you know, know your audience, figure out, um, you know, figure out who, who your panelists um, or your reviewers might be look at successful applications. Um, I know that the NSF makes those available. So uh, people who are awarded the grant, they put their narratives and applications um, up online for you to consult. I think that can be really helpful. Uh, and some agencies actually are really open, uh, open to communicating with applicants. I know that the NSF, in this particular case, the, the officer who oversaw um, this particular um, grant or award uh, was really open to communicating via email and he said I'd even be happy to talk with you over the phone and I think that that, that can be really helpful too. So um, I think that may be all that I have to share at the moment. Uh, this is very, you know, coming from my personal experience so it's a little narrow in that regard. Um, but Allison encouraged me to share yes. what was successful for me and, you know, what I might uh, recommend to someone who's undergoing this process for the first time. Uh, then I thought I'd say a few words from the, the kind of the dirty end of when you're uh, evaluating the proposals. Um, so I, I regularly re, uh, review uh, proposals from a whole bunch of different 
um, foundations. And I think what, one of the things that Jana said is really utterly important. Each one is distinctive. It has its own kind of character, its own processes. Um, and it's really absolutely important um, to get a sense of, of each one. And what that means is you can't take a, um, an NEH proposal and simply kind of Xerox it and send it to uh, Guggenheim. It, it, it just doesn't work that way. And of course, what that means is they're incredibly labor intensive. Um, but I, I, I have found that over, over the years that some people think that they can simply use the same thing you know, for all the different agencies. And, and that's usually a, a, a recipe um, for um, unsuccess. <laughs> <laughs> you can say that. Um, and the, the ways that they, they are um, evaluated are highly uh, distinctive. Um, and um, the, the screening is, is, is different. So the, the stages are all um, um, highly individualistic. So I guess I'll, I'll tell you uh, like two stories, but, um, but also just to uh, reiterate a few things or build on a few things that that Yana said. Um, I think for most uh, proposals in the humanities, so I, I'll try to say a few general things, is if you can't do it in the first paragraph, you can't do it. The first paragraph is just incredibly important. And I think and since that what you offered your story is what I think some editors would call as a kind of hook, that you've got to somehow figure out a way of bringing your, uh, your readers into the proposal in a way that's uh, highly distinctive. And this is like incredibly important because um, very often the evaluative process takes place in the worst time of the academic year. So for example, when I do ACLSs, um, they, they usually arrive, I don't know, October, November, it's the middle of the semester, and you just, um, you have to go through them very quickly. Um, and, and that's not fair to the people who have labored months to do those proposals. But I think the fact of the matter is that we read them really, really quickly. And it has to be the one that, one that I remember. So there's, you, you have to build towards uh, distinctiveness, but not um, like artificial bells and whistles. And figuring out that hook, that entry, that that creates a distinctiveness. It's, oh yeah, I remember that one, is I think incredibly important. And it's, in my opinion, it's all in the first paragraph. Um, and if you can't somehow sustain it in, uh, in the first paragraph, um, you, you can't do it really. The other thing that I, um, I think it's really important is um, in general to avoid the disciplinary lingo that we get so accustomed to. Um, and um, it's important to try to, to get rid of, of kind of insider language. Uh, and I'll say a few more words about that in terms of once you get into these um, committee. And the, the third thing is, um, is relevance. Um, you know, I mean, we tend to of course, all think that our projects are incredibly relevant. Um, but it's surprising. Um, first of all, it's kind of difficult to communicate that. Um, and I think it's really important to remember that we're looking for reasons to reject. And I know that's, that's kind of harsh, but it, it's sort of, because it, there's just so many, it's a blur. And you know, as soon as I can find a proposal that I can throw in the nay category, it makes my life kind of um, easier. It's, it's really kind of a nasty, brutish, and long <laughs> uh, process. Um, but I think, you know, thinking about relevance is really a really, really important thing. And you have to think about relevance both in terms of your own dis discipline, but also outside it. You know, why would someone who is not interested in you know, uh, uh, 19th century Russian literature still want to read that. And that's, 
that's hard to do because it seems to me that we operate in this highly professionalized um, world in which we we write using analytical languages that we feel comfortable with. Um, so let me let me tell then uh, so, uh, two stories. Uh, one, a, a recent story around um, a, a Guggenheim panel, and then I'll talk a little bit about the uh, NEH. Um, so I was recently in the Harry Frank uh, Guggenheim, um, and I we had um, I had to go through sixty five proposals. Mm -hmm. Each one was about twenty five pages long. Um, so I immediately make three piles. One is just I can stop reading. Thank you very much, and that's a re reject. And then ones that I think are pretty clearly just. Uh, shine, and that's pretty much my yes. And then there's always that maybe, work, you know, gray area that usually take up the most time. Um, so then we had to nominate um, our finalists from each pile, and we had I think five of us who were evaluating, um, and then we had to read all of those. <coughs> Groups. So there's another round. So it's just really exhausting. I carried all, it felt like 2,000 pages, you know, of stuff up to New York. And then um, we sat around a table, and we, we had, as evaluators, had to pitch our finalist um, against the other evaluators. And it was, uh, so this was a, a highly conflictual model <laughs> of evaluation. And so, you know, one or two people would just stop me and say, no, that's bullshit. That's wrong. And, and um, it was really, in fact, the, the, the chair woman said, you'll be lucky to get one approved. Um, and um, one of the things that came up uh, a couple of times is uh, this issue of relevance, uh, of just not knowing why, I mean, I can see why it's important for, you know, Brazil, but if I'm not interested in Brazil, who, what, why should I care? And that, that killed a lot of my finalists, you know, and of course, I had worked for them, um, so I was, you know, I was, I was frankly feeling rejected um, uh, by this. And so it was a, it was a very highly con conflictual uh, uh, model. And then basically, I think of out of, um, out of all of our finalists, we funded five. Uh, and that took us um, most of the day. And then we went out and got drunk and, <laughs> and had a good meal. Um, and that's, that's how they do it. Um, the, the NEH, and I've done that, I've done a couple of NEHs, and uh, Jason, I don't know, I haven't done it for a, year, a few years now, so I'm not sure if your process has changed, but I've done the NEH for the major fellowships, and then the NEH, there's a, I think a film category for, for making documentary films? Yeah, yeah, it's right. uh, media um, projects. Media, right. So there, as well as you, you get these these proposals, you, um, if memory serves me correctly, you you enter kind of some scores, um, and then in Washington, you sit around a table with a lot of uh, okay coffee, um, and your computers, um, and we, you know, you, you look at, I mean, in terms of they they combine all the scores, so there are a bunch that are just not. Um, competitive, and then there are um, a, a sum in which there is a high level of consensus, and the ones that have high levels of consensus are usually pretty uh, easy discussions um, that move forward to the the next stage, and it's again in those that next level that that eat up a lot of a lot of time. And one of the things I, I found was that, I, and I can't remember, I think we had five people around the, uh, around the, uh, the table, is that invariably there was always one or two um, curmudgeons um, 
who, for example, would be really turned off by what they saw. I remember this very distinctly one. Anything that smacked of kind of post-structuralist language. It just ticked them off. Um, the problem is that it only takes one to really hurt um, a proposal. And so that's, it, it, so as you're crafting your proposal, you have to remember that you have to carry a, a, a bunch of people along successfully. And that if you lose one person or alienate one person or two people, that that can really substantially endanger the success of, um, of your proposal. And so one of the things that I remember some of the panelists say, they felt like, I don't know what this person's talking about. I mean, the language that they're using, the analytical language, it kind of turns me off. It, it, it alienates me. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then I, I would or someone would try to say, well, this is what they really mean because I know this analytical language. I've read my post-structuralist theory, and it's, this is actually quite cool. Um, but that was, it, it really never, it was rarely successful. Um, and so that's where this issue of how you think about the words you choose are so very, very important. Um, a grant proposal is not a, a piece of scholarly writing. Mm -hmm. It's a different genre. It's a completely different genre, right? And a lot of, and, and it's, it's not a chapter, it's not an article, it's a wholly different animal. Um, and it's usually a, a piece that gets put in the, the desk, mm -hmm. you know, after, after it's done. And hopefully it will yield, you know, funding. But it has, it's a, it's a different, um, it's a different thing altogether. And I think a lot of times um, people forget about, about that. I've always felt that the, um, the ACLS website has a link on the art of writing or a booklet about the art of writing proposals. And I, I have always found that that's a very helpful, um, a helpful document. I believe the SSRC has, um, uh, used to have at least a, a, a piece on their website that instructed uh, the Social Science Research Council. And there, one of the things, uh, as I remember, it's been a few years since I um, reviewed that, but it, um, there's also, um, it has to kind of have an arc. And so a, a really wonderfully done, um, proposal, it, it, it establishes everything in the first paragraph, and then it kind of ends back where it began in a kind of beautiful, seamless um, arc um, that uh, leaves the reader with that sense of the person is in complete command of what they're doing, is, is asking um, important questions, but most importantly that it's memorable. And that's the thing. And this is where it's not fair, is that there's just a shockingly large number of proposals and we're asked to read them very quickly. And Jason, if I remember correctly, the NEH gives its panelists, what, 250 bucks? <laughs> Yes, an incredibly well-paid right, right, panelists. Right, and I, um, you know, so it's it's not a how I would say a lucrative uh, yeah. uh, thing. The advice that you gave was tremendous. I mean, it, it, it hits on a lot of the marks that I go through whenever I do a grant workshop. Um, just to quickly address uh, the, the question that came up, and then I'll sort of backtrack a little bit. Um, it, it is a, a careful balance between working through um, the, uh, the, the argument that you want to make in a grant application that, that doesn't overly rely on the jargon, that's accessible to a broader readership, while also demonstrating um, you know, that you have an awareness of the field. But there are things in the application that, that provide an apparatus uh, for you to demonstrate that knowledge. Like if a fellowship, you have the, the, the 
geography, um, and, in, and some of the other suggestions about referencing other scholars. You can use critical language, critical theory, where it's appropriate to the argument. Um, but uh, you know, that's when you have to do, as Yana suggests, I think, is get, get outside readers, um, people who are not even necessarily in your field or your department, and ask them, can, can you read this? You know, they're informed, they're knowledgeable, they may be the type of person who might serve on an interdisciplinary grant panel, um, and, and say, you know, is this coming across clearly? Am I defining my terms? Um, the, the point that a grant application is its own rhetorical device, its own, its own rhetorical sort of uh, object uh, is an important one. Um, and it's, it's so uh, thinking through those strategies, uh, uh, exactly how my fellow panelists were describing is, is, I think, a good way to go. Just to give you a quick background of who I am, I'll try to keep this um, all brief so we can get to question and answer. Uh, but um, I am Jason Rohde, I'm in the Office of Digital Humanities, one of six of the grant making offices and divisions that's at the endowment. Uh, I've been here uh, going on 11 years. Um, my uh, own PhD is in English literature uh, out of the University of Maryland. Um, and I have you know, a background in working in digital humanities work um, and new media studies. Um, in terms of what I want to sort of go over today, I'm going to sort of talk very quickly about the endowment, you know, give you a sense of how we spend our money, just because it's really important, I think, to see how we structure our various grant programs, uh, speaking to Yana's point about knowing your audience, because um, each of the offices and divisions and those grant pro programs have their own kind of culture at times, um, and, and understanding that uh, I think is helpful in crafting a grant application. Um, I'll, I'll talk, uh, and then I'll skip ahead and just talk about some application uh, tips and writing strategies that I think are often useful, and some of it repeats a little bit about what you already heard, but, um, but hopefully it'll uh, still be useful. Um, one of the things to know, uh, by the way, is the best place to get uh, information about the NEH is at our website, <coughs> neh.gov. Uh, it's relatively newish. We, we were sort of operating on a um, 1996 model of web development for, for the past many years, but we finally up updated ourselves uh, last year. We have a, a newish website, um, and you can just click on the grants button, and it will just all of the grants that are available and their deadlines, which is often very helpful as you're trying to plan ahead. Um, planning ahead, of course, being uh, a very important thing to do when you're looking at grant programs. Um, and then uh, if you click on divisions and offices, you can see the different divisions and offices and look at the grant programs that are specific uh, to those um, offices. Now, um, one of the things I want to point out is, uh, and if I could screencast, I'd show you the, the front page of the NEH website. On the very front page, um, on the left-hand side, it's, there's a thing that says Find Funded Projects. Um, and it, it's a link to our Funded Project Query Form. That's a very government way of saying it's how you search for things that we funded in the past. Jason, um, I can bring that up. I'm going to bring that up in front of you. So oh, OK, great, great. It's sort of like the first link on the left-hand side as you go under the NEH Matters um, thing, uh, banner. Sorry if I'm stutter stepping, I hear a little bit of echoing, so it uh, um, makes it a little, yeah, I think so. So if you click on that link, you'll see that you can search by a variety of things like keywords um, and whatnot, key phrases. But also importantly, as you're narrowing down the kind of project that you might want to do, be it a summer stipend, or a fellowship, or a collaborative research project, or a critical edition of a piece of, you know, of a piece of scholarship or a traditional work, you can look in that grant category, search by that grant category, and see what's been funded. You know, it's organized by uh, year. You can search by specific years if you want. And that's a really useful way of just understanding, hey, what's out there? What's been funded? Um, in, our, in our division, we have a required element of most of our grant programs called environmental scan. And the environmental scan is um, there precisely to uh, demonstrate that you're aware of other projects funded in this area. It's very much like a literature review that you would include in a traditional manuscript uh, proposal. Um, so that's a really useful tool that I encourage you to use. Um, just to give you a sense of what NEH is all about and who works here, um, 
it's important for you to know that any age is first of all funded by you it's a taxpayer organization we focus on three core areas funding basic research and incorporating technology in any aspect of humanities research education or uh, you know um, public programming um, we focus on training uh, in, in technical uh, advanced topics in the digital humanities so anything from social network analysis to text encoding initiative um, things along those lines and we also focus on collaborative uh, work especially that's international on large-scale issues so we funded work alongside of Germany and the UK and that's where our digging into data grant program which is uh, kind of answering addressing the question what do you do with a million books now that we have all these digital resources how do we develop tools and resources so that you can use them as a scholar um, that that's one of our main we have 10 international funders that collaborate on that program. So that gives you a sense of you know, the scope. There are a lot of grant programs in the endowment. So one of the best ways to figure out where you should apply is to contact us. You know, look through the grants that are available. Each grant has a splash page that has a brief description. The guidelines are always in the upper right hand corner. There's always a frequently asked questions. And there's always samples of each of you know, successful grants from prior years. So you can look at successful grants and figure out, okay, this seems like it's in line um, with what I want to do. So how do you apply? First, you go to our website and you read the guidelines. Um, now, if you're uncertain about which category, call me or another program officer. We, we are your taxpayer, uh, tax dollars at work. So we really want you to contact us. We can help direct you to the appropriate grant program. We don't want you to just as my colleagues here have described, each grant program sort of has different requirements, sometimes different audiences. And so we don't want you to spend time crafting a proposal if it's not the right grant category for you. So get in touch early so that we can help direct you to the right program, to the right division, and the right people. Um, so, but once you have a sense of what, the, what program you might want to apply to, it's really important to read the guidelines and read them thoroughly. Um, if I was there in person, I have a slide where I say, step one, read the guidelines. And I say, step two, really, read the guidelines. It usually gets a laugh. It's a little harder on Skype. But um, the point being is that it's really, you'd be surprised at how many people submit applications without paying attention to what the requirements of the program are. Um, so once you read the guidelines, uh, it's also helpful to know what is our peer review process? You know, how, how is this going to be evaluated? Now, at the bottom of each set of guidelines, you'll see precisely the criteria that we give to our peer reviewers to then turn around and review and evaluate the proposals. So that's, again, another great reason to read the guidelines. But let me give you a quick portrait of how, what the overall um, review process is at NEH. It's a five-step review process. The first step is that you submit an application we review it for basic eligibility. Is it addressing the needs of the program? And we take a very broad view of what that might entail. So then we sort all of those applications into different piles. If you're applying to, say, a fellowship application, you'll have a panel that's about, say, 20th century American literature. And your panels will be five panelists who are specialists in 20th century American literature. However, if you're applying to something like a startup grant in my office, we'll probably have a panel that has a historian, maybe a literary scholar, a librarian, maybe a computer scientist, and, and so on. Um, so it depends on the grant program, and you can talk to the program officer for that program about what you might expect. So we convene panels, um, gather together panels uh, for each of the, the many panels that we may have in any particular program. Usually there's between 15 and 25 applications per panel, depending on how long they are. We send those out through our online review system, and panelists will read them, and they'll provide preliminary comments based on the review criteria. And a grade, our grading system runs as follows. There's five grades. Uh, e is for excellent, VG is very good, G is good, SM is some merit, and NC is not competitive. Uh, we used to have NM for no merit, but that was never used, because everybody said, well, this, this person wrote an application, they have some merit. Um, so it's not competitive. And that may mean that it's not appropriate to the grant category or that it's just not up to snuff. Now, from good on are what we call fundable grades. 
Um, although, as my you know fellow panelists have said, as funding is very tight and things are very competitive, um, you know, usually in the E and VG range are what people are looking for. I will point out, however, we do not have a letter grade uh, for P, um, which means there's no perfect application. So you can work really hard on an application, but um, you should always get it in and submit it. Um, better done than perfect is not a bad thing uh, to follow, because as Yana said, a lot of times a second time applicant will be more successful than a first time applicant. So get an application in, even if it's not perfect, so you can get the review uh, content uh, back from the reviewers. So once they submit their preliminary grades, we bring, most times, we'll bring all those reviewers into Washington, D.C. Uh, as you heard described, they'll sit around a table, they'll discuss each one in turn, uh, and then they make a final set of letter grades, which constitutes their recommendation. Now, we will tell you over and over again that the peer review process is the most important process, or part of, the, of our overall review process. But by law, it's only a set of recommendations. What we as staff do is then compile all of those recommendations together in what's known as a committee book that summarizes the applications, the grades, the comments from the panelists, and we turn it over both to our chairman staff and to the National Council of the Humanities, which is a group of 26 uh, private citizens who are appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate, and they serve for a term of six years. They meet three times a year in Washington, D.C. Um, in order to sort of review all the slate, the entire slate of applications, and give their own independent recommendation to the chairman, who by law uh, is the final stage of review and the only one who can actually determine if a great grant is made. Uh, our chairman right now is acting uh, chairwoman Carol Watson. She's a longtime employee uh, of, of the endowment. She's been here for over 40 years and has served in leadership roles uh, across our agency. Um, then we're waiting for uh, uh, a, an appointment to be made as a permanent post. So that's sort of how the review process works. Um, so what are other ways that you can enhance? First of all, get in touch with your Office of Sponsored Research, or whatever you call it, your Office of Grant Writing, perhaps, is what I thought I heard it was called earlier, and talk to them sooner rather than later, because most grants, not all, but most are institutionally driven. And so you need to work alongside of your institution to figure out how to get it submitted. Oftentimes, they'll have their own earlier deadline. And, and as was mentioned earlier, in the case of summer stipends, they have their own sort of pre-review co uh, competition before they submit their two finalists to the endowment. Another important thing to do, get samples and ask questions. Like I said, there are samples on uh, the website for each of the programs, but also if you're searching through um, the, uh, the funded query project, uh, the funded projects query form, and you see one that seems particularly relevant to you, talk to a program officer and say, hey, is, it any, is there any way I can see that application? Because it seems very closely aligned to the ideas that I have. Um, fourth, I would suggest that you draft your application and then get someone to read it. Now, in the fellowships program, they don't do this because of the overwhelming number of applications and, and not the summer stipends either. But in most grant categories of the endowment, we are here to answer your questions and also we'll read drafts. So usually we ask that they're submitted six weeks before the deadline. And we'll read through the draft in our office. We'll sit down. We'll have a. We'll call you, um, and we'll go over the draft with you and have a conversation about it to give you the best advice we can, uh, based on our experience sitting through all the review process uh, for the past several years, in order to you know make your comp uh, your application more competitive. So that's a service. Um, in many ways, I'm repeating a lot of what's already been said. Um, you know, always consider the funding source. You know, we always we can only fund you know humanities uh, research. Um, again, read read the guidelines thoroughly and ask questions. Um, again, I thought that advice about considering the backgrounds of potential reviewers was spot on and absolutely something you should do. And, you know, this is this is all the stuff that you teach your students, right? Whenever you're writing something, consider the audience. Um, when we talk about avoiding jargon, part of that's because, as I described, the long um, uh, application review process, there are several different groups of people who will be reading. 
you know, the staff, the chairman's staff, the national council, and the peer reviewers. And that's why avoiding jargon, thinking about what the product you'll be developing is and how significant that is beyond the limited scope of your own needs. Yeah, this speaks to, again, to some of the advice that was given earlier. Um, when you look at that review criteria at the end of the guidelines, think about how you can explicitly address that review criteria in the application. Um, use your space wisely. Um, it's important to balance an application behind and between the background of the project, but also what you'll do in the project. You know, this is a proposal for future work. So describe what you're basing it on and what's already been done. But don't forget to very clearly describe what's coming. What is it that you'll do with the funding and what, what will be a result from that? Um, a work plan should always be detailed and realistic. A lot of times something that will sink an application is a reviewer will sit back and say, I love this idea. There's absolutely no way they can get the work done in the amount of time that they say they're going to do it. Um, you know, trying to do three times as much work in half as much time. Uh, and also, some obvious things. Stay within the page limit. Pay attention to those sorts of things. It makes a difference because reviewers, as, as Clifton was describing, you know, they're, they're not well paid and they're exhausted. So like, when you're, they're, there's suddenly three extra pages tacked onto the page limit, they know this. Um, I can talk about budget advice in the Q&A if that's of interest, um, and especially things like indirect costs for larger projects and so forth. Um, but uh, I think I'll just probably stop there uh, it, it, with, with, with a final statement that once you submit your application, um, it, it takes time and patience. Um, these, these reviews uh, oftentimes take anywhere between half a year to nine months. Um, and so, and we, but we always stay in the state in the duck guidelines when you should expect to hear. Um, and once you submit it, all you can do is, is kind of wait. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.